Marxism and the Oppression of Women Chapter 8 Toward Revolution As the 20th century approached, the parties of the Second International increasingly substituted a concern with immediate practical gains for a revolutionary long view. At the theoretical level, this reformism, whose origins went back to the 1870s, was dubbed revisionism because it supposedly revised many of Marx's original positions. Revisionism affected every aspect of the international's theoretical outlook, but its impact on the socialist movement's approach to the so-called woman question is hard to assess. Even in the time of Marx and Engels, socialist work on the problem of women's oppression had remained quite undeveloped, and the Second International's general underestimation of its political significance only perpetuated this state of underdevelopment. It was not entirely obvious, therefore, what constituted the orthodox revolutionary position, nor in what matter it might be subjected to revision by reformists. Reformism did not go unopposed within the Second International. A left wing emerged, which sought to restore the movement to a revolutionary path. Although ultimately unsuccessful, the effort deepened its participants' grasp of Marxism into virtually all the major theoretical and practical tasks facing socialists. Because of the confused history of work on the question of women, as well as the generally weak commitment to it among socialists, the problem of women's oppression did not come under explicit scrutiny in the course of this struggle. On this issue, then, the opposition to reformism within the socialist movement could only acquire a rudimentary shape, most visibly within the German Social Democratic Party. The SPD had always been at the forefront of the socialist movement on the issue of women's oppression, even though its theory and practice left much to be desired. It produced the major political texts on the question, Babel's Woman and Socialism. Within the Second International, it consistently took the strongest and most advanced positions for women's suffrage and against all types of discriminatory legislation. The portion of its membership that was female was the largest of any socialist party, reaching 16% just before World War I. It supported, on paper at least, women's active involvement in party affairs, and took some steps towards developing special internal mechanisms to facilitate their participation. By the closing years of the 19th century, the German Social Democratic Party could boast of a large, well-organized, and extremely militant socialist women's movement. Many of these achievements bore witness to the dedicated work of German socialist women themselves. Moreover, on all major issues, women party members generally took political positions well to the left of the party as a whole. As the struggle around reformism intensified, the socialist women's movement became a stronghold of left-wing revolutionary orthodoxy. Footnote. For discussions of the achievements and limitations of the SPD's work on women, see Evans, Honeycutt, Nolan, Quatert. End footnote. While the issue of women's subordination never became a clear area of disagreement, members of the left wing put forth theoretical and practical perspectives that suggested opposition to dominant SPD positions on women. The speeches and writings of Clara Zetkin, leader of the SPD's socialist women's movement, and an early opponent of the reformism engulfing the party, offer some of the clearest statements of this implicitly left-wing approach to the problem of women's oppression. In 1896, for instance, Zetkin delivered an address on the issue at the annual party congress, which was subsequently distributed as a pamphlet. Footnote. According to Karen Honeycutt, some changes and deletions have been made in the 1957 publication of the 1896 speech. While only a single text can be analyzed here, the full range of Zetkin's theoretical and practical contributions should not be underestimated. End footnote. The 1896 talk was an official policy statement of the German socialist movement. At the same time, its text suggested a theoretical position that implicitly countered the movement's drift towards reformism. Zetkin opens the 1896 speech with a brief sketch of the origin of women's social subjugation. Morgan and other writers have shown that the development of private property engenders a contradiction within the family between the man as property owner and the woman as non-owner. On this basis arises the economic dependence of the entire female sex, and its lack of social rights. <laughs> 
quoting Engels to the effect that such lack of social rights constitutes one of the foremost and earliest forms of class rule. Zetkin nevertheless pictures the pre-capitalist family household in conventionally idyllic terms. Quote, it was the capitalist mode of production that first brought about the social transformation, which raised the modern woman question. It smashed to smithereens the old family economy that in pre-capitalist times had provided the great mass of women with the sustenance and meaningful content of life. End quote. Footnote. Honeycutt notes that both Babel and Liebknecht wanted Zetkin to eliminate references to the class rule of men over women in the 1896 speech. But Zetkin argued successfully that the concept could be found in Engels' origin. Draper and Lipau excised the sentence without comment or ellipsis. Earlier, Zetkin had clung even more closely to Babel's work. For example, in a speech delivered in 1889 to the founding conference of the Second International, she stressed women's economic dependence and maintained that, in the same way that the worker is enslaved by capital, so the woman by the man, and she will remain enslaved so long as she is not economically independent. End quote and end of footnote. To this point, Zetkin's account generally follows the lines laid down by the dominant socialist tradition. Only the remark on the specificity of the modern woman question in the capitalist mode of production suggests a different perspective. Zetkin presses further in her analysis of the theoretically specific character of the question of women. Having observed its emergence as a modern question within the rise of capitalist society, she proceeds to dissect it in terms of class. Quote, there is a woman question for the women of the proletariat, of the middle bourgeoisie and the intelligentsia, and of the upper 10,000. It takes various forms depending on the class situation of these strata. End quote. In the following passages, which occupy half the text of the speech, Setkin outlines these three forms of the question, in each case specifying the source of women's oppression, and the nature of the demands for equality, and the obstacles to their adoption. While in places her discussion falters, sometimes quite seriously, the very attempt to develop such a systematic analysis constituted an implicit rebuke to the vagaries of the dominant socialist position. Zetkin begins with the ruling class women of the upper 10,000. The specific woman question here involves wives' sexual and economic dependence upon men of their own class. Not work, either paid or unpaid, but property represents the core of their problem, since women of this class can employ servants to accomplish virtually all their household tasks and spousal duties. When these women, quote, desire to give their lives serious content, they must first raise the demand for free and independent control over their property, end quote. To achieve this demand, they fight against men of their own class, much as the bourgeoisie earlier had to fight against all privileged classes. In this sense, the struggle of ruling class women for control over their own wealth after marriage constitutes, quote, the last stage in the emancipation of private property. And Zetkin views it as entirely consistent with bourgeois claims to liberate the individual. The woman question presents itself in a quite different social form among the women of the small and middle bourgeoisie and the bourgeois intelligentsia. These are the intermediate strata, which undergo intensifying strain with the expansion of capitalist relations of production throughout society. As a class, the small and middle bourgeoisie is increasingly driven to ruin, its small-scale enterprises unable to compete with capitalist industry. At the same time, capital requires an intelligent and skilled labor force, and encourages, quote, overproduction in proletarian brain workers, with the result that the bourgeois intelligentsia gradually loses its formerly secure material position and social standing. Men of the small and middle bourgeoisie and of the intelligentsia often postpone marriage, or even put it off altogether. The basis of family life in these strata becomes ever more precarious, with a growing pool of unmarried women, and Zetkin argues that, quote, the women and daughters of these circles are thrust out into society to establish a life for themselves, and not only one that provides bread, but also one that can satisfy the spirit, end quote. <laughs> 
among these women of the small and middle bourgeoisie and the bourgeois intelligentsia. A specific woman question appears in the form of a demand for women's economic equality with men of their own class in the field of employment. Women fight for equal access to the education that will enable them to enter the liberal professions, and for the right to carry on those professions. These demands amount to nothing less than a call for capitalism to fulfill its pledge to promote free competition in every arena, this time between women and men. And, according to Zetkin, it is the fear of this competition within the liberal professions that lies behind the petty obstinacies of male resistance. The competitive battle soon drives the women of these strata to organize a women's movement and demand political rights, in order to overcome the barriers to their full economic and social participation. In speaking of the bourgeois women's movement, Zetkin refers mainly to the organized activity of women from the small and middle bourgeoisie and from the intelligentsia. Like women of the ruling class, these women focus on their lack of equality with men of their own class, although as earners rather than as property owners. In both cases, there's a gap between the promise of equality offered by bourgeois society and its actual absence in daily life. While the economic aspect represents the heart of the matter, Zetkin observes that the bourgeois women's movement encompasses far more than purely economic motives. Quote, it also has a very much deeper intellectual and moral side. The bourgeois woman not only demands to earn her own bread, but she also wants to live a full life intellectually and develop her own individuality. End quote. Moreover, at all levels, quote, the strivings of the bourgeois women's rightsers are entirely justified. End quote. Footnote. The term women's rightsers is as awkward in German as it is in English, and was employed polemically within the socialist movement. End footnote. Among the women of the proletariat, the woman question assumes yet another form. Working class women have no need to fight for entry into capitalist economic life. They are there already. Quote, for the proletarian woman, it is capital's need for exploitation, its unceasing search for the cheapest labor power that has created the woman question. End quote. Moreover, Zetkin claims the working class woman already enjoys both equality and economic independence, although she pays for them dearly, because of her dual obligations as worker both in the factory and in the family household. Quote, Neither as a person nor as a woman or wife does she have the possibility of living a full life as an individual. For her work as a wife and mother, she gets only the crumbs that are dropped from the table by capitalist production. End quote. Since capitalism has relieved her of the need to struggle for equality with the men of her own class, the working class woman has other demands. In the immediate future, quote, it is a question of erecting new barriers against the exploitation of the proletarian woman. It is a question of restoring and ensuring her rights as wife and mother. Furthermore, the end goal of her struggle is not free competition with men, but bringing about the political rule of the proletariat. End quote. Alongside the men of her own class, not in competition with them, she fights to achieve this goal. Her principal obstacle, then, is capitalism itself. At the same time, adds Zetkin, the working class woman supports the demands of the bourgeois women's movement, quote, but she regards the realization of these demands only as a means to an end, so that she can get into the battle along with the working men and equally armed, end quote. Obviously, a great deal of what Zetkin has to say about the three forms of the woman question departs from the realities of capitalist society. To some extent, these inaccuracies owe their existence to her failure to distinguish, within the 1896 speech, theoretical argument from empirical description, a confusion shared by most socialist writers of her day. Beyond this problem, however, Zetkin's contribution remains limited by certain theoretical weaknesses. That is, the distortions in Zetkin's consideration of the woman question appear to be largely empirical, but they have theoretical roots as well as serious political ramifications. 
in the first place, along with virtually all her contemporaries, not to mention Marx and Engels. Zetkin glosses over the issue of domestic labor within the family household. She severely underestimates the contradictions that arise from the sex division of labor in all three classes. In this way, she loses an important opportunity to strengthen her argument for the existence of specific forms of the woman question, according to class. Empirically, the ruling class wife's mediated relationship to housework bears little resemblance to the working class woman's never-ending domestic drudgery. And at the theoretical level, the distinction stands out even more sharply. For only the unpaid domestic labor in the working class household contributes to the reproduction of the labor power required for capitalist production. Second, Zetkin's picture of the working class woman constitutes an abstraction that verges on caricature. While the ability to command a wage always entails a certain level of independence, in no way could it be asserted as a fact that, quote, the wife of the proletarian, in consequence, achieved her economic independence, end quote. In 1896, no less than now, working-class women suffered grievously from their lack of equality with men of their own class at the workplace, in every possible way. Pay, working conditions, access to jobs, opportunity for promotion, and so forth. Furthermore, working-class women lacked equality in the civil sphere and were oppressed as women within the working-class family. Elsewhere in the text, Zetkin even cites several examples of the harmful effects of these phenomena, not only for women, but for the working class movement. By not confronting such facts theoretically, Zetkin simplifies her analysis, but thereby passes over the problem of specifying the relationship between the fight for women's equality and the struggle against capitalism. Moreover, along with most socialist theorists of her period, she fails to distinguish women workers from working-class women. That is, in speaking of the proletarian woman, she always assumes that the woman participates in wage work. In this way, household members who do not engage in wage work, for example, wives, young children, the elderly, the sick, become analytically, and therefore politically, invisible. At the root of these confusions, which haunt socialist work to this day, lies the theoretical invisibility of the unpaid labor required to reproduce labor power in the working class household. Finally, Zetkin errs in arguing that specific woman questions arise only within those classes thrust forward by the capitalist mode of production. In a period in which peasants still made up the majority of the European oppressed masses, she, along with many other socialists, idealized the peasantry as representing a, quote, natural economy however, quote, shrunken and tattered, under the impact of emergent capitalism. In general, the parties of the Second International tended to ignore the difficult theoretical and strategic problems presented by the existence of this massive peasantry, alongside a growing industrial proletariat. And Zetkin, despite her political acuity, all too easily fell into line. Peasant women, she claimed, quote, found a meaningful content of life in productive work. Their lack of social rights did not impinge on their consciousness. And therefore, quote, we find no woman question arising in the ranks of the peasantry, end quote. Here, the reality of any peasant society, past or present, strenuously contradicts Zetkin's remarks. Among European peasants at the end of the 19th century, the woman question had its own, quite specific, character, which required analysis by the socialist movement. Peasants could not, any more than women, be excluded from a revolutionary perspective. Having clarified, to the best of her ability, the theoretical issues involved in the problem of women's oppression, Zetkin devotes the rest of the 1896 speech to the current situation of the women's movement in Germany, and the practical tasks to be taken up by the party. In the long run, the goal of the bourgeois women's movement, equality with men of one's own class, hardly threatens capitalist relations of power. Hence, quote, bourgeois society does not take a stance of basic opposition to the demands of the bourgeois women's movement, end quote. In Germany, however, a prejudiced and short-sighted bourgeoisie fears any reform whatsoever, 
not understanding that if the reforms were granted, nothing would change. Quote, the proletarian woman would go into the camp of the proletariat, the bourgeois woman into the camp of the bourgeoisie, end quote. Zetkin also cautions against, quote, socialistic outcroppings in the bourgeois women's movement, which turn up only so long as the bourgeois women feel themselves to be oppressed, end quote. In this context, the responsibility falls on the German Social Democratic Party to make good its commitment to strengthening the socialist women's movement. Zetkin proposes certain general guidelines for socialist work among women. The party's main task is to arouse the working class woman's class consciousness and engage her in the class struggle. Hence, quote, we have no special women's agitation to carry on, but rather socialist agitation among women. End quote. Zetkin warns against the tendency to focus on, quote, women's petty interests of the moment and emphasizes the importance as well as the difficulty of organizing women workers into trade unions. She notes that several major obstacles, specific to women as women, stand in the way of successfully undertaking socialist work among working-class women. Women often work in occupations that leave them isolated and hard to mobilize. Young women believe that their wage work is temporary, while married women suffer the burden of the double shift. Finally, special laws in Germany deny women the right to political assembly and association, and working-class women, therefore, cannot organize together with men. Zetkin emphasizes that special forms of work must be devised in order to carry out socialist work among women. For example, a proposal that the party appoint field organizers, whose task would be to encourage working-class women to participate in trade unions and support the socialist movement, receives Zetkin's backing. The idea had already been endorsed at the 1894 Congress, and Zetkin's comments actually represent an insistence that the party follow through on its commitment. If developed systematically, consistently, and on a large scale, she argues, the network of field organizers would draw many working-class women into the socialist movement. Family obligations make it impossible for many women to come to meetings, and Zetkin therefore underscores the critical role of printed material. She suggests the party produce a series of pamphlets, quote, that would bring women near to socialism in their capacity as workers, wives, and mothers, end quote. She criticizes the party's daily press for not taking a more political approach in articles designed to speak to its female readership. And she proposes that the party undertake the systematic distribution of agitational leaflets to women. Quote, not the traditional leaflets, which cram the whole socialist program onto one side of a sheet together with all the erudition of the age. No, small leaflets that bring up a single practical question with a single angle, from the standpoint of the class struggle. End quote. Furthermore, these leaflets must be attractively printed, on decent paper and in large print. As good examples of agitational material for women, Zetkin cites contemporary United States and British temperance literature. Behind these commitments lies more than a criticism of the party's work among women. Zetkin clearly makes a general indictment of the officialdom's bureaucratic and passive approach to socialist agitation and propaganda. Unlike the reformists, she insists that the party take, quote, the standpoint of the class struggle, this is the main thing, end quote. When the party reaches out to women, it must treat them as political beings. In the short as well as the long run, the socialist revolution needs women's creative participation at least as much as working class women need full liberation. Work among women, quote, is difficult, it is laborious, it demands great devotion and great sacrifice, but this sacrifice will be rewarded and it must be made. For just as the proletariat can achieve its emancipation only if it fights together, without distinction of nationality or distinction of occupation, so also it can achieve its emancipation only if it holds together without distinction of sex. End quote. Most important, she concludes, quote, The involvement of the great mass of proletarian women in the emancipatory struggle of the proletariat is one of the preconditions for the victory of the socialist idea for the construction of a socialist society, 
End quote. In sum, Zetkin's 1896 speech made an important theoretical and political contribution to the socialist movement's understanding of the problem of women's subordination. Significantly, the speech rarely mentions love, sexuality, interpersonal relations, or human feelings, subjects that represented the core of the so-called woman question for most of the 19th century socialists. Instead, Zetkin focuses on the theoretical issues and practical tasks that confront the socialist movement. Only her comments on the working class household sometimes depart from this businesslike and unromantic stance. Even idealizing working women as nurturant wives and mothers of the fighting male proletariat. Similarly, her sketch of the socialist future recalls Babel's work in its depiction of the family as an isolated entity, as well as its emphasis on women's independence. Quote, when the family disappears as an economic unit and its place is taken by the family as a moral unit, women will develop their individuality as comrades advancing on a par with men with equal rights, an equal role in production and equal aspirations, while at the same time they are able to fulfill their functions as wife and mother to the highest degree. End quote. From a theoretical standpoint, such remarks retreat from the position put forth in the body of the speech. Politically, they suggest an almost ritual concession to the ambiguity of the socialist tradition, probably necessary to guarantee the speech's acceptance by party delegates. The major portion of Zetkin's text attempted to build a theoretical foundation for revolutionary strategy. More explicitly than any socialist thinker before her, she assessed the particular theoretical character of the problem of women's subordination in class society. Her discussion of the specific forms taken by the so-called women question in terms of different modes of production, and the various classes within them, remains, despite its problems, important. Indeed, its weaknesses, which can be traced to inadequacies shared by the socialist movement as a whole, actually delineate a new set of theoretical tasks. To the extent that Zetkin worked out her analysis within the framework of Marx's theory of social reproduction, she generally avoided the theoretical quagmires, utopianism, economic determinism, and the like, into which both Engels and Babel had fallen. In this sense, the thrust of Zetkin's remarks placed her in opposition to the reform's tendency to revise Marx's theory, however undeveloped that theory had remained on the issue of women's oppression. Consistent with her vigorous opposition to reformism spreading throughout the socialist movement, Zetkin's strategic orientation in the 1896 speech pushed well beyond two obstacles hindering socialist work among women. First, she questioned the Second International's tendency to identify the woman question with the general social question, even if she did not adequately specify their actual relationship. In this way, she attempted to force the socialist movement to confront the practical problems flowing from its professed commitments. And second, she insisted that women's active participation is central to the socialist revolution, and therefore refused to postpone serious socialist work with women. In later years, with the hindsight afforded by several more decades of experience, Zetkin reached the conclusion that the Second International had actually been wholly incapable of providing a sound theoretical or organizational foundation for such work. Beset with reformism and, quote, the most trivial Philistine prejudices against the emancipation of women, end quote. The socialist movement had taken, quote, no initiative in the theoretical clarification of the problems or practical carrying out of the work. In this atmosphere, Zetkin commented, quote, the progress achieved was essentially the work of women themselves, end quote. The eruption of World War I in 1914 forced the tension within the socialist movement between reformism and a more revolutionary outlook to a breaking point. Most parties in the Second International supported the war, taking whichever side their national bourgeoisie happened to stand on. Working-class internationalism seemed to vanish into thin air as a narrow patriotism swept through the socialist ranks. Meanwhile, individual left-wing socialists recognized they had lost the battle against reformism 
and began to regroup. They opposed the war, either assuming an essentially pacifist stance, or, more militantly, viewing it as an opportunity for revolutionary action. As hostilities dragged on, popular discontent replaced the initial patriotic euphoria, and important sectors of the population turned to those who sought to end the war. In consequence, the pacifist and revolutionary minorities in every socialist party grew stronger. Their anti-war perspective seemed vindicated when the Bolshevik party came to power in Russia in 1917. The Bolshevik Revolution transformed not only Russia, but the international socialist movement. For the first time, revolutionaries had fought for and won the opportunity to begin the transition to a communist society, and the effort commanded the attention of socialists everywhere. The seizure of state power was only the first step, and weighty problems confronted the new society. Externally, the forces of capitalism tried, in every way possible, including military intervention, to undermine the revolution's success. And internally, the task of building a socialist society quickly proved tremendously difficult. Every question that had formerly concerned the international socialist movement now became a matter of the utmost urgency, to be resolved in concrete detail in both theory and practice. Among these tasks loomed the problem of women's subordination, made all the more pressing because of several peculiarities of the Russian Revolution. First, the majority of Russia's population consisted of peasants, half of whom lived the particularly hard life of peasant women, often working in the fields as well as the household, and brutally oppressed by feudal traditions of male supremacy. Second, women wage earners constituted a relatively new and fast-growing group, especially in the very small Russian industrial sector, where their numbers rose to include 40% of the industrial workforce during the war. Last, radical movements in Russia had traditionally attracted a large number of women activists, who often played leading roles, and the Bolshevik party was no exception. Objectively, and from the start, the question of women represented a critical issue for the future of socialism in Russia. The history of women's situation in the Soviet Union has yet to be fully analyzed. Most accounts sketch a gloomy picture in which numerous obstacles conspire to block full liberation for women. Insufficient material resources, erroneous or opportunist political priorities, wholesale ideological backwardness, a low level of theoretical attention. Although correct in its general outlines, the picture remains blurred. In particular, Despite a great deal of research, it fails to situate the history of the question of women within an adequate understanding of the development of the Russian Revolution and the international socialist and communist movements. Moreover, the problem of the nature and source of the theoretical framework underpinning Soviet work on the issue of women's subordination has barely been addressed. The rudiments of that theoretical framework were established by V. I. Lenin, the leader of the Bolshevik Party, and a prolific writer on questions of socialist theory and practice. Lenin's comments on women make up only a tiny portion of his work, and it is not clear to what extent they were taken up within the Bolshevik party or implemented in practice. Nonetheless, they are important for their insight into the theoretical heart of the problem of women's oppression. Like Zetkin, Lenin took a left-wing position in the struggle against reformism. In the Russian context, however, this struggle acquired its own form, quite distinct from the public battle fought within the massive and powerful German party. Under the Tsars, Marxism remained an illegal movement in a backward country. Neither a strong trade union movement nor a socialist party affiliated with the Second International could be built. The major theoretical task for Russian socialists at the end of the 19th century was to assimilate Marxist theory in order to put it into practice in their own country, where conditions differed sharply from the industrializing nations of Western Europe and North America. Opposition to revisionism among Russian socialists therefore initially took the particular shape of an effort to grasp and defend Marxism itself. Two tendencies within Russian radicalism stood in the way of the developing Marxist movement. 
First, the Russian populists, or Narodniks, argued that the peasantry constituted the backbone of the revolutionary process, that Russia would be able to bypass the stage of industrial capitalism, and that the peasant commune provided the germ of a future communist society. Second, a group known as the, quote, legal Marxists, so named because they wrote in a form capable of passing Russian censorship, embraced Marxism largely because it recognized the historically progressive character of capitalism. In opposition to the Narodniks, the legal Marxists welcomed capitalism as a necessary first stage on the way to socialism. As might be expected, many of them later lost their interest in revolution and became staunch bourgeois liberals. A central theme in Lenin's earliest writings was the defense of Marxism against attacks from the Narodniks on the one hand, and distortions by the legal Marxists on the other. At the same time, he began to elaborate a Marxist analysis of the development of capitalism in Russia, and of the prospects for a socialist revolution. When Russian Marxists founded the Social Democratic Workers' Party after the turn of the century, bourgeois liberalism became yet another target of his polemics. Lenin's first comments touching on the problem of women's oppression appear in his 1894 critique of the Narodnik writer Nikolai Mikhailkovsky, who had caricatured Marxist theory. The issue of women's situation arises because Mikhailkovsky mocks Engels' discussion of the production of man himself, i.e. procreation, in the preface to The Origin, castigating it as a peculiar form of, quote, economic materialism. He suggests instead that, quote, not only legal, but also economic relations themselves constitute a superstructure on sexual and family relations, end quote. In reply, Lenin ridicules Mikhailovsky's argument that, quote, procreation is not an economic factor, and asks sarcastically, quote, where have you read in the works of Marx and Engels that they necessarily spoke of economic materialism? When they described their world outlook, they called it simply materialism. Their basic idea was that social relations are divided into material and ideological. Mr. Mikhailovsky surely does not think that procreation relations are ideological. End quote. The way Lenin defends Engel's statements in the preface, however questionable their theoretical status may be, is significant. He puts the major emphasis on the point that Marxism is not economic determinism, and he insists on the material core embedded in all social relations, even those involving women, the family, and sexuality. This perspective, which relies far more on Marx than on later socialist theorists, became the foundation of Lenin's approach to the problem of women's subordination. Capitalism developed in Russia on the basis of a savagely patriarchal feudal culture. In The Development of Capitalism in Russia, published in 1899, Lenin examined the impact of capitalist social relations on peasant life. Because of its highly socialized labor processes, capitalism, quote, absolutely refuses to tolerate survivals of patriarchalism and personal independence over the long run, end quote. Lenin argues that in this sense, quote, the drawing of women and juveniles into production is, at bottom, progressive, end quote, despite the particularly oppressive conditions these sectors often encounter under the rule of capital. In sum, quote, by destroying the patriarchal isolation of these categories of the population, who formerly never emerged from the narrow circle of the domestic family relationships, by drawing them into direct participation in social production. Large-scale machine industry stimulates their development and increases their independence. In other words, creates conditions of life that are incomparably superior to the patriarchal immobility of pre-capitalist relations. End quote. Lenin points out that any attempts to, quote, ban the work of women and juveniles in industry, or to maintain the patriarchal manner of life that ruled out such work, would be reactionary and utopian, end quote. With these remarks, Lenin has simply used Marxist theory to develop an analysis of the significance in Russia of women's and children's participation in social labor. Obvious though this approach may seem, 
At the time, it represented a rare return to the best of Marx and Engels. In these early decades of the Russian Socialist Movement, Lenin also addressed several specific problems having to do with the special oppression of women as women. He condemned prostitution, locating it in social conditions, and incidentally taking swipes at liberal attempts to end it. He analyzed the class character of the birth control movement, contrasting the psychology of the petty bourgeois liberal to that of the class conscious worker. At the same time, he underscored the need for socialists to support the abolition of all laws limiting availability of abortion or contraception. Quote, Freedom for medical propaganda and the protection of the elementary democratic rights of citizens, men and women, are one thing. The social theory of neo-Malthusianism is quite another. End quote. Most important, Lenin repeatedly denounced the peasantry's century-old traditions of patriarchal life and their particularly brutal implications for women. Footnote. On the peasantry, see Lenin in the section entitled Socialism in Lenin's article Karl Marx. On prostitution, see Lenin, page 26. The relatively high number of articles published in 1913 undoubtedly had to do with the revival of a Russian socialist women's movement in 1912-14 and the first celebration of International Women's Day in Russia in 1913. End footnote. In subsequent years, Lenin began to pay special attention to the relationship between sex oppression and class cleavages. While he had always supported equality between women and men in the traditional socialist manner, he now came up against the more difficult problem of specifying the nature of that equality. Initially, the problem appeared in the context of discussions on the so-called national question. Among socialists, questions of the equality of nations and the rights of national minorities became matters of heated debate in the early 20th century, as nationalist feelings and political conflict intensified around the world. At the root of these developments lay the emergence of imperialism, with its chain of oppressed and oppressor nations. Hence, it was imperialism that forced Lenin to examine the nature of equality in bourgeois society and to delineate the role of the struggle for democratic rights in the context of a revolutionary movement to overthrow capitalism. The peculiar character of the question of democratic rights owes its existence, according to Lenin, to the fact that in capitalist society, political phenomena have a certain autonomy with respect to economic phenomena. Numerous economic evils are part of capitalism as such, so that, quote, it is impossible to eliminate them economically without eliminating capitalism itself. By contrast, departures from democracy constitute political evils, and in principle can be resolved within the framework of capitalist society. Lenin cites the example of divorce, an example first used by Rosa Luxemburg in a discussion of the national question, and the right to uphold national autonomy. It is perfectly possible, if rare, argues Lenin, for a capitalist state to enact laws granting the right to full freedom of divorce. Nonetheless, quote, in most cases, the right of divorce will remain unrealizable under capitalism, for the oppressed sex is subjugated economically. No matter how much democracy there is under capitalism, the woman remains a domestic slave a slave locked up in the bedroom, nursery, kitchen. The right of divorce, as all other democratic rights without exception, is conditional, restricted, formal, narrow, and extremely difficult of realization. In sum, capitalism combines formal equality with economic, and consequently, social inequality. End quote. If equality is so difficult to realize in capitalist society, why should socialists enter the fight to defend and extend democratic rights? Why devote energy to a seemingly useless battle on bourgeois terrain? First, because each victory represents an advance in itself, however limited, and that it provides somewhat better conditions for the life of the entire population. And second, because the struggle for democratic rights enhances the ability of all to identify their enemy. As Lenin put it, beginning of long quote, 
Marxists know that democracy does not abolish class oppression. It only makes the class struggle more direct, wider, more open and pronounced, and that is what we need. The fuller the freedom of divorce, the clearer will women see that the source of their domestic slavery is capitalism, not lack of rights. The more democratic the system of government, the clearer will the workers see that the root evil is capitalism, not lack of rights. The fuller national equality, and it is not complete without freedom of secession, the clearer will the workers of the oppressed nations see that the cause of their oppression is capitalism, not lack of rights, etc. End of quote. In this sense, the battle for democratic rights is a means for establishing and maintaining the best framework within which to carry out the class struggle. Lenin's work on democratic rights went well beyond earlier socialist analyses of the nature of equality. At the theoretical level, it offered serious insights into the mystery of the relationship among sex, class, and national oppression in capitalist societies. And practically, it constituted an important element in the development of revolutionary strategy with respect to national minorities, oppressed nations, and women. Here, twin dangers haunted the socialist movement. On the one hand, some denied the critical significance of these special oppressions and refused to take them up seriously in practice, and often in theory as well. On the other, many developed reformist positions that scarcely differed at the practical level from bourgeois nationalism or liberal feminism. Armed with an understanding of the character of democratic rights, a socialist movement had a better chance to confront national and women's oppression without slipping into either error. Once the bourgeois state has been overthrown in a socialist revolution, as happened in Russia in 1917, full political equality comes immediately onto the agenda. The new Soviet government began to enact legislation granting formal equality to women in many areas. Yet, precisely because formal equality remains distinct from real social equality, even in the socialist tradition, legislation could not be enough. Indeed, observes Lenin, quote, the more thoroughly we clear the ground of the lumber of the old bourgeois laws and institutions, the more we realize that we have only cleared the ground to build on, but are not yet building, end quote. In the case of women, he identifies as the major barrier to further progress the material phenomenon of unpaid labor within the family household. Writing in 1919, for instance, he points out that despite, quote, all the laws emancipating woman, she continues to be a domestic slave because petty housework crushes, strangles, stultifies, and degrades her, chains her to the kitchen and the nursery, and she wastes her labor on barbarously unproductive, petty, nerve-wracking, stultifying, and crushing drudgery, end quote. From the start, Lenin always put more weight on the problem of women's material oppression within the individual family household than on their lack of rights, their exclusion from equal social participation, or their dependence upon men. Speaking of peasant and proletarian women, and sometimes of petty bourgeois women as well, he repeatedly drew a picture of domestic slavery, household bondage, humiliating subjugation by the savage demands of kitchen and nurse drudgery, and the like. This emphasis was unique in the Marxist literature, and probably originated in Lenin's focus on the peasantry, with its traditions of patriarchal relations, as a critical element in the revolutionary struggle. Whatever its source, Lenin's concern with the problem of domestic labor enabled him to formulate the question of women's oppression and the conditions for women's liberation with a clarity not previously achieved. Lenin argues that the special oppression of women in capitalist society has a double root. In the first place, like national minorities, women suffer as a group from political inequality. And in the second, women are imprisoned in what Lenin terms domestic slavery. That is, they perform, under oppressive conditions, the unpaid labor in the household required to maintain and renew the producing classes. Quote, the female half of the human race is doubly oppressed under capitalism. The working woman and the peasant woman are oppressed by capital 
but over and above that, even in the most democratic of the bourgeois republics, they remain, firstly, deprived of some rights because the law does not give them equality with men, and secondly, and this is the main thing, they remain in, quote, household bondage, they continue to be, quote, household slaves, for they are overburdened with the drudgery of the most squalid and backbreaking and stultifying toil in the kitchen and the individual family household, end quote. In this passage, Lenin makes it evident that he considers the second factor, domestic slavery, to be, quote, the main thing. Just as the source of women's oppression as women is twofold, so the basic conditions for their full liberation are also twofold. Obviously, the lack of equal rights must be remedied, but this political obligation is only the first and easiest step because, quote, even when women have full rights, they still remain downtrodden because all housework is left to them, end quote. Lenin recognizes that developing the material conditions for ending women's historic household bondage constitutes a far more difficult task. He mentions the need, quote, for women to participate in common productive labor and in public life on a basis of equality. But he puts major emphasis on efforts to transform petty housekeeping into a series of large-scale socialized services, community kitchens, public dining rooms, laundries, repair shops, nurseries, kindergartens, and so forth. Footnote. On women in social production, see Lenin, and also on socialized services. End footnote. Finally, in addition to the political and material conditions for women's liberation, Lenin points to the critical role of ideological struggle in remolding, quote, the most deep-rooted, inveterate, hidebound, and rigid mentalities inherited from the old order, end quote. To implement its policies with respect to women, the new Soviet government faced the task of developing appropriate methods of work on several fronts. It was easy enough to pass legislation removing women's legal inequality, but to persuade people to live with it was quite another matter. Lenin addressed this issue in a speech to the hastily organized First All-Russia Congress of Working Women, held in Moscow in November 1918, where his appearance caused a sensation and seemed to offer tangible evidence of Bolshevik support for the undertaking of special work among peasant and proletarian women. Using the new marriage law as his example, Lenin stresses the importance of careful propaganda and education, for, quote, by lending too sharp an edge to the struggle, we may only arouse popular resentment. Such methods of struggle tend to perpetuate the division of the people along religious lines, whereas our strength lies in unity, end quote. Similarly, the drawing of women into the labor force and the initiation of measures to begin to socialize housework and child care required the utmost sensitivity to existing conditions. Here, Lenin argues that, quote, the emancipation of working women is a matter for the working women themselves, for it is they who will develop the new institutions. At the same time, the party had the obligation to provide guidance and devote resources to their work. And in 1919, Lenin already found its commitment wanting. Quote, do we, in practice, pay sufficient attention to this question, he asks, which in theory every communist considers indisputable? Of course not. Do we take proper care of the shoots of communism which already exist in this sphere? Again, the answer is no. We do not nurse these shoots of the new as we should. End quote. Women's participation in political life constituted an area of serious concern for, quote, you cannot draw the masses into politics without drawing the women into politics as well, end quote. Here again, Lenin regarded the timid efforts of both the international socialist movement and his own Bolshevik party as insufficient. Two major obstacles hampered the work. In the first place, many socialists feared that any attempt to do special work among women inevitably smacked of bourgeois feminism or revisionism and therefore attacked all such activities. For this position, Lenin had nothing but scorn. While arguing that within the party itself, 
a separate organization of women would be factional. He insisted the realities of women's situation meant that, quote, we must have our own groups to work among women, special methods of agitation, and special forms of organization, end quote. Even more serious was the lack of enthusiasm among socialists when it came to providing practical support for the special work among women. In a conversation recorded by Zetkin, Lenin criticized the general passivity and backwardness of male comrades on this issue. Quote, They regard agitation and propaganda among women and the task of arousing and revolutionizing them as of secondary importance, as the job of just the women communists. Unfortunately, we may still say of many of our comrades, quote, scratch the communist and a Philistine appears, end quote. Behind this view lies contempt for women, quote, in the final analysis, it is an underestimation of women and of their accomplishments, end quote. As evidence of the seriousness of the problem, Lenin describes how party men complacently watch their own wives take on the burdens and worries of the household never thinking to lend a hand. Lenin concludes that special work must be done on these questions among men. Quote, our communist work among the masses of women and our political work in general involves considerable educational work among the men. We must root out the old slave owner's point of view, both in the party and among the masses. End quote. According to Zetkin's notes, Lenin went so far as to weight this task equal with that of forming a staff and organizations to work among women. Footnote. It must be remembered that virtually no socialist in this period seriously challenged the sex division of domestic labor, not even Alexander Kollontai. End footnote. Lenin's remarks about male chauvinism never acquired programmatic form, and the campaign against male ideological backwardness remained at most a minor theme in Bolshevik practice. Nonetheless, his observations on the problem represented an extremely rare acknowledgement of its seriousness. As for the development of special work among women, numerous socialists, almost all of them women, took it up as best they could. On the issues of love and sexuality, Lenin, like Zetkin, said very little and nothing that was meant for official publication. In a correspondence with Inessa Armand in 1915, he criticizes her notion of free love for its lack of clarity. While agreeing that love must be free from economic, social, and patriarchal restrictions, he cautions against a, quote, bourgeois interpretation that wishes to free love from interpersonal responsibility. Later, in the conversation recorded by Zetkin, Lenin directs a lengthy tirade against those who give too much attention to, quote, sex and marriage problems. He criticizes German socialist organizers who dwell on the subject in discussions with women workers. And he worries about attempts in the Soviet Union to transform the nihilist tradition of sexual radicalism into a socialist framework. Beginning of quote. Many people call it revolutionary and the communists. They sincerely believe that this is so. I am an old man, and I do not like it. I may be a morose ascetic, but quite often this so-called, quote, new sex life of young people, and frequently of the adults, too, seems to me purely bourgeois and simply an extension of the good old bourgeois brothel. All this has nothing in common with free love as we communists understand it. End quote. For Lenin and much of the socialist tradition, it was individual sex love and socialist society that was destined to transcend the hypocritical, two-sided sexual life of capitalist societies, abolishing repressive marriages on the one hand and prostitution on the other. Individual sex love was the socialist answer to, quote, the decay, putrescence, and filth of bourgeois marriage, with its difficult dissolution its license for the husband and bondage for the wife, and its disgustingly false sex morality, end quote. Anything else smacked of promiscuity, end quote, promiscuity in sexual matters is bourgeois. It is a sign of degeneration, end quote. Footnote. On nihilist sexual radicalism, 
and on the issue of sexuality in the Russian socialist movement. See Stites. End quote. Lenin's formulations, as remembered by Zetkin and published after his death, functioned mainly as a rationale for sexual conservatism among socialists. In the long run, the experience of the Russian Revolution raised at least as many questions about the relation of women's liberation to socialist transformation as it answered. Zetkin might have observed that here, too, history had posed a specific woman question, distinct from those thrust forward by capitalist relations of production, the question of women in the era of the transition to communism. Given the generally underdeveloped state, <clears throat> Given the generally undeveloped state of socialist work on the problem of women's oppression, Zetkin and Lenin's theoretical contributions failed to make a lasting impression. With some exceptions, 20th century socialists and communists have adopted positions very similar to those dominant within the Second International. Yet the legacy is both incomplete and ambiguous. End of section.